uh, AI uh, has been investigated to try to, uh, for instance, predict fault in the telemetries. Especially if you use deep learning models, uh, AI might become a, a, a black box. So you lose interpretability of the model themselves. There are some exceptions because there are satellites that, that use some other satellites to send the data, but that's, let's say, a minority of the missions. Welcome back on the Space Info Podcast. Here, we talk about space and everything related to it. If you are passionate about space, astronomy, technology, and everything about it, you can join all our social platform at the Space Info Club or our website at www.spaceinfo.club, where tons of content and a community of experts are there waiting for you. This is the Space Info Club. Good morning, everyone. And welcome back on the Space Info podcast. Today we have a very special guest from the European Space Agency. Today we have uh, uh, Mr. Gabriele Meoni with, uh, with us. So good morning, Gabriele. How are you? Hello, good morning. I'm fine. Thank you very much for hosting me here today. That's, that's a real pleasure for us. And uh, yeah, so today we talk about uh, uh, a, a very uh, inflationary topic nowadays, which is artificial intelligence. And we joined the, the topic uh, together with uh, uh, Earth observation. So we are for sure talking about space and we will be talking about our planet. So uh, Gabriele, what are you doing uh, at the moment? What's your field of occupation? Yes, so I'm innovation officer in the advanced concept study office and in the FILAB of the European Space Agency. There are both, uh, let's say two Uh, groups uh, of people trying to explore new technologies that may be, be disruptive uh, in the future. In particular, the FILAB is uh, more focused on Earth observation. My expertise is related to uh, onboard processing, so onboard satellite processing, artificial intelligence uh, for uh, Earth observation application. And uh, as an innovation officer, I'm exploring new technology that might have, uh, uh, let's say, disruptive, uh, some potential to disrupt Earth observation application in the future. So, uh, by, by the way, talking about uh, artificial intelligence, uh, we all know that it has many, many applications and uh, it's been developed uh, along the years, but uh, only in the last couple of, uh, of years, it came out on the, let's say, wide public. So how do you envision the artificial intelligence technology as transforming the Earth observation, uh, let's say, from space and uh, in the next decade? Yeah. Thanks a lot. Uh, first of all, let's start being, by being pedantic on the terminology. In a sense, uh, AI is uh, nowadays uh, it's quite a vague terminology, and uh, also the let's say the meaning is quite broad depending on the definition. Uh, in Earth observation, when you talk about artificial intelligence, you mostly refer to machine learning and even more often uh, deep learning applications. And well. Let's say AI is a broad, uh, uh, like a broad plethora of application when it's applied uh, uh, nowadays. First of all, the, the most immediate one is the fact that uh, AI has demonstrated, let's say, unprecedented capabilities uh, to extract actionable information uh, from Earth observation data. So uh, it's nowadays it's still of the art for uh, a lot of applications, uh, a different level uh, from, let's say, more scientific applications or to help the scientists to, I don't know, predict climate models uh, uh, or uh, to improve climate modeling or uh, also to for open national services uh, uh, to predict disaster or to manage disasters uh, or um, there are some applications to also improve, to help policy makers. So the application of AI is quite broad because of that. But also with the now large language model, generative AI, there is also some resource trend in trying to use uh, artificial intelligence to help, uh, let's say, non-expert uh, and uh, end user to interact with that observation data by creating digital assistance. For instance, this is one of the projects that we are trying to do in the FILAB. And then there is the last trend, uh, or at least uh, of the biggest one, uh, where artificial intelligence uh, has been trying to use onboard satellites to create, to create smarter satellites that react immediately, very quickly, to potential, let's say, uh, anomalies on the data or uh, disaster that you want to detect. Yeah, so particularly from, from the last thing you said, it seems that, to me at least, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, 
we can have uh, a couple of, let's say, different fields of application of artificial intelligence or machine learning, if it's uh, a better way to say it. Uh, probably uh, one is the observation of the planet and the other is, uh, let's say, the orbital mechanics of, uh, of the satellite. Uh, if I'm understanding correctly, we, not only we, can, we will be able to, uh, let's say, to analyze the data that we gather from the observation, but also to improve the, let's say, the orbital slots that w we use uh, for the satellite constellation, for example. Yes, so uh, not only on the mechanics, but also on the operation aspects, so in the way we, the, the satellites uh, uh, are operated. And, the sense uh, there is a lot of research uh, uh, in trying to make satellite more autonomous from the operation perspective. Uh, nowadays, satellite produce a lot of telemetries, uh, and uh, AI uh, has been investigated to try to, uh, for instance, predict fault in the telemetries and uh, to create smarter satellite that can uh, react to this problem. But also to to create novel, uh, let's say, uh, and more efficient way to process the data itself because. The, the amount of data that is produced is growing uh, over the time, and of course, even the, the bandwidth of satellite is growing. But um, it's also for some application very interesting to try to limit the amount of data that you want to send. Uh, or when you process in area like uh, ocean deserts, uh, uh, that's in some operations, in, sorry, in some missions, uh, they, uh, they don't belong to the, the plan acquisition areas. By processing the, the data on board, you could uh, if you have enough battery, of course. Uh, also, try to expand the acquisition area by spotting anomalies uh, in, in the oceans or anomalies in the desert. So you can also change the way you acquire the data because of this potential uh, uh, increased capability to spot interesting things, let's say. Yeah, uh, yeah. while you were talking, I was thinking about, uh, uh, let's say, the, the operation side uh, and thinking about uh, uh, the fact that, uh, uh, it's, let's say, semi-autonomous technology could uh, uh, take some steps into the, the, the decisional chain uh, into the final one. But I suppose that uh, the, the final one is, uh, in any case, uh, demanded to, uh, to a human, probably for legal aspects or things like that. We have... Uh, we have had some problems of this sort with the, the orbital satellites in the in the last few months. So I wouldn't like to uh, to come into this topic too too deep because probably it's not the, the topic of today. But maybe you'd like to tell us some example of uh, uh, imagery analysis and how they can be enhanced and uh, can improve our understanding of uh, of our planet. Maybe. Well, yes, uh, of course. I mean, AI has been. Uh investigated for a lot of different applications, uh, uh, not talking specifically about deep learning, but a more, let's say, broader definition of AI, where uh, uh, we have uh, much simpler algorithms, uh, let's say, more trustworthy, probably, from from some extent. And it is now a data state of the art. And when we talk about it, we talk about uh, wildfire, volcanic, volcanic detection, uh, or we're talking about also uh, water monitoring, uh, uh, to, to find uh, I don't know, a different kind of anomalies there. Uh, there is a lot of research uh, uh, to, to try to find plastic debris there. And when you relate to onboard aspects, uh, uh, of course, uh, this is, a, to be uh, honest, a quite new uh, trend that, uh, that we, we are experimenting in trying to, to move part of the processing on board. So it's not what, uh, let's say, the typical mission do, but uh, there is for sure, let's say, some trends uh, from the industrial uh, and uh, even the academic part to explore this kind of new mission paradigm, let's say. Yeah, I, I think that uh, uh, this is uh, very, very fascinating. And uh, yeah, probably uh, if we want to go deeper into this, this topic, I, I know that people that will be listening uh, will be very curious about, uh, let's say, uh, imagine to, to put their hands on uh, concrete projects. So maybe you'd like to mention some of the most uh, promising projects uh, which are ongoing inside your agency. Uh, I remember that uh, that's the European Space Agency and uh, conjugating uh, with uh, uh, both artificial intelligence and uh, Earth observation. Yes, um, if it's okay for you, I will talk mostly about the projects uh, in my section, so in the field. Yeah, the sure. I know better. Uh, yes, there are, we have some research, uh, some ongoing projects uh, to explore, uh, let's say, foundation models. Uh, 
So, namely, the even if the definition there is uh, there's no let's say common agreement on the definition. When I talk about foundation model, we are talking about let's say big models uh, uh, around at least one million parameters. Uh, Train in a in a in a self-supervised matter without um, uh, many many data to try to dim, to reduce the amount of labeled data. Uh, then we have some research to do, uh, or some industrial projects to do it, to create a digital assistant, uh, because one of the problems that we have with earth observation data that is not easy for uh, uh, well non-expert, non-technical expert to interact with them to extract information and. Uh, you know, some, sometimes uh, uh, the, the typical end user just want to have actionable information. They don't want, they might not want the data. So creating a digital assistant, uh, for instance, with the LLM, large language models, uh, like the, you could uh, try to create a way for the, this kind of end user, non-expert one, to interact by using, let's say, human language. Mm -hmm. So this is also a project that we are trying to do. And then we are uh, extensively exploring uh, um, um, on, uh, onboard AI applications. Uh, and one of the the, the satellite that's been launched last August is called FISA2, and uh, there's actually a satellite with onboard processing capabilities, and uh, the the, the FILAB uh, contributed to this mission uh, by. Uh, providing our expertise on AI and uh, by creating a challenge uh, called Orbital AI Challenge, uh, where we selected some application from the community that uh, were uploaded, basically, or will be, sorry, uploaded on both the satellites. Yeah, I, I think that particularly the, the very first thing that you said is, uh, at least in my view, one of the most uh, promising aspects of uh, introducing artificial intelligence in uh, Earth observation. Probably not everyone who's listening is a, a technical fellow, let's say, uh, of the technology. And we are all used to see uh, beautiful images taken from space, from satellites, usually geostationary satellites of our planet. Okay, they are uh, very beautiful, but uh, from these uh, to the point of uh, having uh, useful data, uh, I think that there is a, a large gap. And uh, what you were mentioning, uh, in my view at least, is uh, uh, let's say the, the most revolutionizing aspect of uh, using uh, an assistant which guides, uh, in the end, that's, there, there's always a human, but uh, it's guiding him in, uh, into his or her decisions. Maybe he's uh, uh, involved in the industry, not uh, only in research. So probably, yeah. Also, in my view, it's a very promising aspect. So thanks a lot for mentioning. And yeah, maybe you'd like to, to tell us how did the Earth observation change with respect to the early years of satellites monitoring uh, the surface of our planet? Yes, I mean, the, uh, first of all, uh, uh, the first change that uh, comes to my mind is due to the technology improvement that leads to miniaturization. No? So if you think about the old satellites, the uh, the bigger mission uh, in the past there were basically uh, missions with very big satellites typically and uh, whose cost was very high and because of that it was quite uh, the, access, the access to space was quite uh, uh, limited basically so at the space agencies uh, like like this kind of central role nowadays uh, with the, the, the coming new space due to technology improvements uh, there's been let's say uh, an increased accessibility to space, uh, so uh, of course space agency cover still cover a quite important role, but there is also a mission that are not drive by space agency alone, but also by industries, by including academia. Uh, there are projects uh, with cubes that uh, where the the same students can also contribute, and uh, and then of course uh, this is uh, I think one of the main aspects. Uh, and then AI might lead to an additional uh, change in the future um, because of the possibility to move uh, intelligence uh, on board and processing the data, we might have uh, a different uh, way for which satellites behave. So nowadays satellites, uh, or at least in the last year, satellites were mostly like eyes, uh, producing image uh, that then were analyzed on the ground. Nowadays, uh, we are trying to move some intelligence on board uh, for which satellite can react quickly and send early alert for disasters, but also communicate each other. And maybe one of the current research trends is exploring novel acquisition systems like TIP and Qs, 
where you have two satellites with different sensors that tip and queue each other to announce the, the acquisition capabilities, for instance. This is also quite a fascinating trend that uh, uh, already some industries and some research centers have been started exploring. And this is probably not uh, there yet, but uh, it's, it's a trend that we, we, we start seeing, it, at least in the exploration phase. Yeah, I, I think that uh, this is uh, one of uh, probably one of, let's say, most fascinating, just to use this word again, uh, aspect, because uh, uh, the, the fact, imagine that you have a, 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 a such a, a dynamic environment in which different kind of uh, semi-autonomous system are interacting is probably one of the biggest potentiality of, uh, of the whole technology. And so uh, maybe you, I mean, everything is so amazing on, on, the, on the paper, let's say, but I, 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 only, I can only imagine that uh, there can be a lot of challenges, uh, uh, particularly all, just to remain inside the topic of artificial intelligence uh, when it's applied to Earth observation. So maybe you'd like more to tell us more, uh, in particular also to the approach of uh, the European Space Agency, as maybe uh, more specifically, if, uh, if you'd like, uh, of, this, of the FILAB, uh, how it's addressing these challenges. Yes, uh, absolutely. So uh, there are both technical and non-technical questions, uh, sorry, technical and non-technical challenges. Uh, given my expertise, uh, we probably mention only technical ones, uh, but so in terms of technical challenges, uh, well, one of the, the main one uh, that is not, I guess, uh, shared only with space, but uh, with many different applications is the fact that, uh, especially if you use deep learning models, uh, AI might become uh, 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 a black box. So you lose interpretability of the model themselves. So that means uh, you gain for some application in, in performance, but you don't know how, and you don't know why. And this is, of course, a challenge, especially if the application is a scientific mo is related to scientific models, climate models, or things like that, for which you would like, of course, to have an interpretability. But also, if uh, it's related to operational services, for instance, for which you start sending alerts, uh, for which you have to react. And uh, uh, this is, of course, one uh, of the main issue. Another one uh, that is really technical is the fact that uh, to train an AI model, you need labels. So you need image, let's say, with a with a house. If you want to detect if you have a house or not, uh, with the rain with house and not uh, not house, and you you provide some image, you need to have not only the image but also someone telling you this is a image with house and this is not the image without. This is called labels. And yes, we have so many data, so many earth observation data, but actually very few label data. And this is an issue because labeling, especially for some application, is quite challenging, requires experts. Uh, it's quite expensive, it's time consuming, and depending on the application, uh, also quite boring and frustrating. So that's a big issue because for some application, the lack of label data, actually, during the development of AI model, uh, there are some studies that tells you that it takes more like the 80% of the time. So this is one of the, the big issues. And the, the way we are trying to react to that is the, is for instance, in different ways, exploring uh, the so-called unsupervised or self-supervised learning where the, the, the AI model try to train uh, itself without using the label. Uh, so it's like a student try to learn without receiving too much feedback from, uh, from the teacher, let's say. And one of the approaches, uh, the other one that we are exploring is the creation of foundation models that I said before. But this comes with its own consequences because foundation model, as I, as I told you, are big models. That means creating big infrastructures, uh, computing infrastructure required dedicated expertise to also operate this model, uh, funding for invest to actually create this model. It's also quite challenging because uh, it's always very difficult to understand how much you should invest to try to create the model until you get some novel functionalities, for instance. And then there is also the, the problem that uh, because of this model is often quite big, they are not, you create this model, they are quite useful, but might be not accessible by everyone because you might need quite powerful in computational infrastructure for them. So this is also another challenge that is, of course, worth mentioning. 
Yeah, probably the, the last one is uh, uh, the, the most comprehensible to, to the most of the people who are listening. As uh, yeah, as everyone can imagine, uh, as let's say uh, the the whole internet has grown in the last year, we, we uh, it's under our uh, under everyone uh, everyone's eyes that uh, the number of servers and computers has grown exponentially to to stay at the same pace. Probably uh, at the very same. Uh, in the very same way the whole computational power used to manipulate that data will have to grow or maybe uh, this this kind of empirical law will be interrupted and we'll discover uh, different things but uh, yeah to, just to summarize uh, the the first topic you mentioned uh, for the people who are listening uh, yeah it, as you said it's like learning uh, by ourselves without uh, too much input from uh, from the outside so we have to be sure that uh, what we are learning from the very few information we have uh, it will conduct us to uh, a predictable not not really a predictable but uh, uh, let's say a, a safe path to to a desired uh, destination if if i'm correctly understanding so okay so uh, so what role do you see uh, the ai playing in optimizing the satellite co constellation operation and also the, the acquisition strategies so is if there is one well uh, I may have mentioned it already uh, <laughs> one is for instance the novel acquisition systems where you have new satellites or the the fact that when you process AI on board uh, you can discard some data depending on the content uh, and then this might lead to uh, since so the, let me explain this like when satellites need to download the data, uh, they can only do it when they are closed. Or, I mean, this is not totally true, but it's true in most of the missions, when they are close to what is called the ground station, so the station that is there to receive the data. There are some exceptions because there are satellites that, that use some other satellite to send the data, but that's, let's say, a minority of the missions. Um, uh, and is not affordable for all the missions, let's say. And that means uh, you have... A, a, limited time and also as you probably have experience with your internet connection uh, at home you have also limited bandwidth that means you need to be quite efficient uh, in the data that you want to send so standard way to send the data uh, or the, the current approach is called band pipe and is uh, when the satellite is close to the receiving station you send a comment you ask for the data you get the data back and you get all the data but for instance uh, uh, you might think that uh, more or less, the, more than the 50% of the data that you have is covered by clouds. And depending on the instrument that you get, you get the image of clouds. That might be not really, I mean, I'm not saying that they are not useful, but maybe they are not the typical information that you want. So if you manage to discard them, you can save 50% of your bandwidth uh, to save, to send something else. And one way to do that is moving an AI on board to process the information. Uh, and this was, for instance, one of the missions that uh, we did in the FeeLab, uh, it's called FreeSat1. Uh, not only with the FeeLab, just to be uh, fair with all the partners, but the, in the, Asia, the, the European Space Agency, uh, that we experimented the, the, the first convolutional neural network uh, on, uh, let's say, an AI processor to fly on board the uh, Earth Observation Satellite. Uh, this uh, was a 2020 mission, basically. And we did exactly that. We tried to experiment and try to see if you could uh, use AI to detect clouds, basically. That's not the only, uh, we particularly use deep learning, it's not the only approach, but we demonstrated that it's possible also with deep learning and AI. Yeah, this actually uh, surprised me quite a lot because, yeah, I, I never thought about this. And uh, probably I, I think that also the majority of the people who will be listening will uh, uh, will think about uh, patterns, uh, pattern recognition. So uh, observe something and say, okay, this is similar to, to this or that and labeling, as you mentioned, but uh, excluding most of the images because they are useless and doing it uh, uh, at the very beginning. So at the source of the data will, uh, will save you a lot of bandwidth. And I, actually, yeah, I, I never thought about this, but that's a very interesting point. So thanks for, for telling and uh, yeah. To, to mention this, this is not the typical approach that you do, huh? because uh, especially okay. for scientific missions, so you would like to get uh, all the data. And uh, this is, of course, understandable. But you can imagine that if you have a commercial mission uh, for which you cannot afford to have uh, uh, many ground stations uh, or uh, you need to pay for the ground station, uh, so then, uh, especially for commercial mission or mission where you have a very few bandwidth, because maybe you have a small satellite like a, like a CubeSat, uh, 
with a with a limited receiver and you need to share the ground station with other uh, with other mission then for this kind of mission can become very interesting and for instance if you're not really interested in the clouds uh, and you can afford to lose some image because AI models are not perfect. Uh, and in the worst case, you can actually waste some good images. But if you can accept that, then this is something that you can do, for instance. Yeah, and, and probably the, the business per perspective on this, this, uh, this topic uh, is something that will come uh, into the play in the close future, I think. So uh, you, you mentioned the, the efficiency and also the effectiveness of, uh, of, of this kind of approach. but. Uh, can we uh, apply uh, this efficiency, uh, particularly the second one, so the effectiveness uh, to disaster monitoring uh, and uh, also the, the, the promptness in responding uh, in to, to these events? Yes, yeah, so in terms of research, uh, uh, we have quite of, um, we're exploring this uh, quite a lot. Uh, there are a lot of exploration in trying to use AI to to process the information and, and to try to do it very quickly. Of course, there are many challenges there. Uh, one is related to the fact that uh, to train AI model for disaster, you need to have a lot of disasters uh, in, the, in the training set. And uh, so you need to have a picture of disasters, but likely disasters are not so common. <laughs> so that means uh, to do a proper validation of the model and to train them, uh, you need to collect a lot of images over time, uh, and maybe they are not always available for the same sensor. So there are some challenges there, but of course, uh, it's possible. And also, if you really want to react quickly, react quickly, one of the approaches that you can do is what I was mentioning before, so, so to try to process the information on board. But there you have another challenge, uh, is the limited uh, amount of power that you have, uh, and also time uh, to process the data. So. What we are trying to do in the field is exploring the possibility of AI to process the data without much pre-processing, for instance, so to process the so-called raw data. This is not what happens typically on typical missions. So, so when you have a, uh, an image produced by a satellite, you typically download it to the ground, and then you do all the fancy pre-processing that you want because end user wants to clean images. But that's probably not what you want if you want to react quickly to a disaster. So what we are trying to do is to try to see if AI is uh, capable to process uh, uh, raw data. And uh, you can believe me that raw data produced by satellites has a lot of problems. Uh, they might have a very different sort of noises due to the fact that there's a lack of calibration uh, or lack of uh, image, like, uh, image correction, uh, uh, white balancing, if you are uh, familiar with, uh, with uh, let's say, uh, uh, typical cameras that, that, that you get, uh, typical images you get from normal cameras as well. And many other, uh, let's say, also geometrical defects that you get in the image. So because of that, the processing of raw data is quite challenging. One of the research that we are trying to do is, uh, is AI capable to process this, this very broad data distribution for which you can even process raw data and learn uh, to uh, deal with this uh, quite nosy distribution uh, that you have? Uh, and uh, for some application uh, well, well, for which we are publishing results, we are quite getting good, interesting, interesting results. And uh, we are shortening so much the time for which you can have a response, at least on the paper, then we need to see in reality and to make some experiments. But just to let you know, yes, there are some research uh, to that. Uh, there are so many challenges and it's a very fascinating topic in my opinion. It's actually part of my research topic. Okay, so congrats, and I hope we will see uh, some results close in the future, because uh, me personally, I'm very curious about this topic. And uh, yeah, so, <laughs> thanks. And uh, yeah, so uh, we have seen that uh, also the whole technology is uh, rapidly advancing. We were talking about image processing. You mentioned also that you need uh, uh, very, I wouldn't say very specific, but uh, very powerful uh, pieces of hardware. So as everyone can imagine that that's not that easy uh, going, let's say up there, changing uh, some uh, motherboards just to, to talk uh, very, <laughs> very badly uh, into a satellite because you basically, you cannot do that's not that's unfeasible, but uh, considering this, uh, this kind of uh, advancement, uh, maybe you'd like to talk about uh, future application uh, for artificial intelligence. Uh, and I would like to, uh, to close the, to, to close, let's say the focus, uh, uh, particularly on uh, constellations, since we have mentioned that uh, miniaturization and let's say cooperation between uh, different satellites is becoming uh, almost a trend. And maybe uh, th there is something also uh, beyond uh, strictly Earth observation. We, 
maybe uh, not, not everyone knows but uh, China is uh, planning to build uh, a constellation around the moon so maybe we will have some kind of impact also uh, in that sense yeah I would like to uh, reply to this question by providing a vision uh, that we have uh, not only okay. in the film but also in the advanced concept study office uh, um, if I remember correctly in 2021 we launched a campaign uh, to collect ideas in a topic that we call cognitive cloud computing in space. So this topic uh, envisioned not only AI on board satellite, a single satellite, uh, but uh, let's say a, an entire ICT revolution and then the AI move on board satellite. So in the vision, you have a different satellite that communicate each other, exchange information by using the so-called inter-satellite link. So it's just communication link between satellites uh, for which you have a, some, in some case of distributed intelligence. So not only a single satellite uh, 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 process the data, but actually satellite uh, tips and queue each other, as I was saying before, to generate new acquisition systems uh, or uh, coordinate the acquisition uh, to get maybe advanced monitoring of disaster or different things. Or for instance, uh, outside of the earth observation field, uh, uh, there have been some studies exploring the possibility to have a different asset, uh, trying to train uh, on, uh, um, when I say asset, uh, I may mean like a lander or may mean a rover or uh, on Mars, uh, trying to train the distributed AI model on, let's say, distributed satellite constellation on distributed space assets uh, to try to gather information maybe for instance on a Mars on a, uh, on a, on a Mars rover uh, and to try to train it to uh, recognize these different terrain features, or uh, also to try to see if you can use a different, uh, in the case of Earth observation satellites, to explore uh, um, different sensors uh, with different, uh, um, say, complement complementary sensors uh, to gather more information about an event. So this is the vision I would like to, to provide. That's what we really like. I would like to explore in the future, because this actually if working might disrupt not only at observation, but let's say, as we mentioned in the call, the, the, the total space infrastructure. Yeah, and now, now that uh, uh, you let us, uh, let us all dream basically about the, the future, maybe just to make happy also the people who are uh, more concerned about, uh, uh, let's say privacy, data security, and also uh, ethical considerations, maybe we just we would just like to conclude uh, uh, with this topic uh, because uh, uh, re recalling what you said uh, in, in the middle of the interview, you mentioned AI, AI particularly AI models. Uh, at a certain point, uh, after a certain step, uh, they sort of become uh, uh, black boxes. So you give uh, you give them some kind of inputs, but you cannot 100% predict the output you will get because you don't. Uh, uh, perfectly know how the model is uh, elaborating this, that, this data. So is there, is there any uh, concern about uh, security and, and also ethics? Yes, of course. Uh, there is also, uh, despite I have to admit, this is not my field. Uh, as far as I know, there is a lot of research uh, in, this, uh, in this kind of topic. Uh, there have been in the past uh, demonstration uh, of uh, possibility to make a deep learning model take completely wrong decision just by injecting noise that is not visible to human, the so-called adversarial attacks. Uh, of course, there is a lot of research. Uh, most of the, let's say, at, le at least with this kind of noise distribution, uh, there were uh, papers demonstrating how to make the, noise, the, the, the AI model more robust. Uh, but of course, there are, for instance, uh, security concern in the, sen in the sense uh, there are safety concerns because, of course, if you give the AI the possibility to take completely autonomous decision when you have disasters, uh, you might end up in a wrong situation. It also leads to ethical concern. So how to mitigate all of that? Of course, there is a lot of effort to try to make the AI model more explainable uh, because if you make them more explainable, then uh, you might also understand what makes the AI fails. And there is an entire field of research called explainable AI that is trying to change the AI model to create new AI model or to produce new techniques to make, at least to try to understand why the AI model takes some kind of decision. This is mostly applied to deep learning application, uh, but this is one kind of field that uh, goes a bit into this direction, for instance. Uh, 
uh, ethical consideration, yes, there, there are one I mentioned before. Uh, but I think you also, in your uh, discussion, uh, sort of provide one uh, one of solution. Is not using AI to take. Uh, it is not letting AI take a decision, uh, but it's using AI to take informed decision. That can be a better way to help us uh, each other, uh, to, to help us uh, to take good decision when you have disasters, uh, or uh, even using AI to complement uh, other techniques if you want to get insight for uh, uh, disasters or for application that requires, uh, let's say, a daily, let's say a human response just to make sure that we are taking the correct decision. But it's also through the other way around. Uh, for the application where, where the AI is able to extract the features and is the state of the art. Is a human more capable than AI models uh, to take uh, better decisions? This is also a question that I think we should ask ourselves and we should give us a response on this. Yeah, I, I think that uh, I was thinking about how to, co to better conclude this interview, but uh, I think that we will conclude it with, uh, with your question. And uh, yeah, maybe it would be interesting if uh, everyone who, who's listening uh, could, uh, could tell uh, his opinion or her opinion uh, below in the comments, letting us know uh, what's uh, his or her thought about this. And uh, yeah, I don't have a very precise question to what you said, I have a very precise answer to your question. So uh, I just say thank you, Gabriele, for being here. Thanks for this interview. That was very, very interesting. So pleasure. Yes, thank you very much. Hope to have you uh, back again soon. Thanks a lot. Thanks to the whole Philab and the European Space Agency for this opportunity. And uh, I hope that everyone will find this interesting. So thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot.